G'day, I'm Joel. And I'm Harry. And we are from Airborne, and you are rocking out to the, the ACDC family, and we will be with you shortly. Rock and roll. I mean, well, this one we wrote in the studio and, you know, basically recorded in five weeks, the whole thing. So that's something, a bit of a, you know, I haven't really done that before. Uh, so, yeah. And work with Dave Cobb, that's a completely different thing. Nice. Yeah. And, of course, make a record with Harry. <laughs> so there's three. It's a trifecta. We had been mates for about 10 years before joining the band, so that made the whole process super easy. Um, we played the cricket team together back then. Uh, yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. What were your best figures? Uh, <laughs> six for 22, you got one. Yeah, yeah. six for 22. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <coughs> I was good at cutting up oranges too. Just a ripping bowl up. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh geez, I bowl so quick and to take my own head off. <laughs> so that's basically how it's like. We're just a couple of dickheads and, you know, we're just uh, all a bunch of dickheads in the band together. There's um, just dickheads everywhere. So, where are they all? Where they going? That made it easy. I couldn't imagine joining a band with a bunch of dudes from, you know, the other side of the world who you'd never met before or, you know, you hadn't established a friendship with. Um, oh, yeah. Like, like, joined the band and we jumped in the two of us for nine months straight basically so um, it was definitely an easier dynamic because we're already mates we're already um, it's not like he's an American or something like some hotshot kid out of America uh, next guitar whiz or something like that sort of vibe like like even in the 80s they did that a lot like a band would get replaced they get someone made from the UK or America or something and like it'd always be weird because you get like these this band of like you know, they'd be like all, you know, Englishmen in the band or, or Scotsmen in the band. And then they would have um, uh, this weird American, like, yeah, guys, what's going on? And it's like, dude, you don't even fit. Like, it's just weird. We wanted to make sure it was a mate first. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just the best way to do it, really. Just kind of get a bunch of friends together to play kick-ass rock and roll and just go out there and just tear up. That's how it starts out. And that's the, it's the core that every band starts at. At some point you all got in a garage together or you were mates somehow or there was some connection that got you together. Like even with Metallica, like Hepfield and James, they, they go way back, don't they? Like, I mean, like um, there's things like that and it, you know, that keeps a band at its core and it's, yeah, you gotta have a mate first. And, and that's what happens, that's what happens as a band and that's a mark of your own fucking band's life is when if, you, if a member leaves and to replace another member. Well, you've been a band that long. It's not like, you know, we, we made one record and no one could stand the fucking thing and say everyone left, <laughs> which happens a bit. But um, uh, it's like, you know, the band's on its fifth record now. Six, if you count the other one, the first one. Uh, and it's like it's been going a long fucking time. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a mate to join the band, then that's fucking mega double, triple A plus. <laughs> Plugged in a few times. I can't actually tell you what songs we used it on. But we uh, had a, we had a few malfunctions going on with a few different things. But no, nah, that that unit is fucking great. It really does. You know, it, it adds like a. It's almost like a weird sort of compression, or it does something to the guitar. And I think it just kind of boosts up the signal just a little bit as well. Yeah, you you mess around with it. It might have been in nitro I used it. I can't really remember, but no, definitely. I mean, you can probably hear on a record or what albums you use on. Yeah, well, it's in the rig, so oh, okay. it's in the rig every now and then as well. And um, I mean, the thing's so noisy, but it's like it's it's like. A, but I think that's the whole point. Like, I think yeah. I think it's just part of rock and roll. I think yeah, it's our rig's already noisy, so it just it adds more. But I think Malcolm christened it the furnace back in the day when Angus would you know, turn his guitar on or whatever with that thing and we'd call it the furnace so um, so we heard through the through Schaefer uh, he was telling us he was to call it the furnace it's like yeah, it fucking sounds like a furnace sounds like fucking bodies are burning every time you turn the thing on but I tell you what as soon as you hit a chord or a few notes it sounds great it's worth it
Playing with dogs. Yeah, go off the dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't quite enough. Yeah. We no, love dogs. If we could, you know, just go on a crusade and fucking, you know, just rescue every dog in the world and just fucking give them all hugs and licks, it'd be the best in the world. We just love dogs. You own any dogs of your own? Yeah, I have a dog. Her name's Rosalie. Oh, wow. Yeah. What about yourself? Yeah, I've uh, got uh, Maggie and Dolly. And uh, what were you doing? Uh, Samoid and uh, Golden Retriever. Oh, wow. And yourself? Uh, Rosalie's a rescue. She's a, uh, she's a bit of an English Mastiff mixed with a whole bunch of sort of... A bit of boxer in there or something? Yeah, a bit of boxer. Yeah. There's a yeah. bit of everything. She was tied to a post and beaten up. And then uh, but now she's just... She's a bit of a princess. She's a little bit of a brat. She expects more than probably what. Got her own spot on, spot on yeah, the couch. She has her own spot <laughs> on the couch, and she gets upset if she doesn't get her fresh chicken wings and stuff. And, and she actually she talks to you when she wants to go for a walk now, and just gets in your grill. And it's like, listen, do you remember what it was like when you were tied to a post? And she's like, yeah, but I'm not now. I go, then we've got to go for a walk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, love so, dogs. Um, Cars too, we love cars, not that we, you know, okay, um, could do a burnout or anything, but I'd uh, love to be able to do burnouts. Burn soon. Yeah, my own burnouts, I'm just going to do burnouts. Uh, just, just love blokey stuff. Burnouts in the barrows. Yeah, burnouts in the barrows. Just love, like, just cars when they're just fucking <coughs> ripping up tyres and fire and, and just the sound of an engine is just really cool. Nothing better than the smell of burning rubber. Yeah, V8, you know, just yeah. fucking... Or burning cool. tubes. Yeah. <laughs> Even that, similar yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I used to really love, like, just nerding out on amplifiers and stuff and guitars, and now I just don't give a shit about it. I'm just like, <laughs> they're loud, they sound great, sounds good. What more do you need? Yeah, I mean... I think when you start out young, you're fascinated, fascinated by the tools and not what you can do with them. I think afterwards you become more about being fascinated what you can do with them. And oh shit! I mean, if somebody actually I had a dream last night, I was just woken up. That's why a bit late to the interview. And I was dreaming. This was just before. It was this Les Paul. It was fucking butterscotch blonde, and it had no piping or anything around. It actually had no edges. It was like an alien guitar. So it had no sort of right angles. Just sort of rounded. But it was a Gibson, and it fucking and a guy kept asking me to buy it, and the neck was broken. He said, just do this, and it's fine. I was like, it's not fine. <laughs> the neck's broken, man. I was really loving the A chord on it. It was cool, so I, I don't know if I bought it in the dream or not. I don't know if the neck's broken, and you're still playing yeah. the guitar. Yeah, so, I, yeah. If only it was that easy just to go, nah, man, it's yeah. broken now. Yeah. Then you just, like, <laughs> click it back in. Look, it's sweet. <laughs> to a guitar shop and we signed to Capitol Records uh, in Los Angeles in 2006, I think it was, and and we went into this guitar shop and they're like, let's buy you guys guitars and fucking, what do you want, some amplifiers, we got everything, and then it's like, cool, oh. and then just, it was just you walk up to the wall, there's a black one, there was a white one, uh, Rosie took the black one, I took the white one, and that was it, we were just like loving our explorers, and, That's it, and it was just literally like, can we have these, so yeah, we'll put it on the Capitol account. Cool, can we get some amps? Yep, yeah, capital account. <laughs> like, we come from living on the dole in Australia in a band, as a band all in the one house to living off the same fucking pot of baked beans to someone saying, just take one of your guitars you want in the shop. So we just um, we just went, fuck, this is cool. And we were like, oh, this will be tough as. And we plugged them in in the shop and they sounded great. And now I'm fucking struggling to find a guitar that sounds as good as the one that I took from there, uh, which is the main one I use live. But um, it's... Uh, no, they do have a thing though. They've got, I like the lighter wooded ones, and they seem to be from 2000. And actually, I won't say because then some fucking psychopath will go out and buy them all. So I won't say what year they're from. But um, no, they have like a cross between a kind of that little bit of an SG sort of vibe mixed with their own vibe. A lot less Les Paul sounding. I don't really love uh, that typical rounded dark sound that a Les Paul can have, like the big thing that weighs like the big cunt yeah. that weighs fucking 10 kilograms and your back's all fucking, and you got discs flying out your back, you're trying to fucking play a solo and you end up looking like a hunchback in Notre Dame after your 50 year career playing with Les Pauls, like, um, but I like the lighter wooded ones and also good for climbing and the balance of the headstock on an Explorer, it just, you hold the guitar like this, it just sits there. And it's cheek fucking down. So imagine Angus has probably got this massive fucking oh, bicep yeah. to hold the thing up. Everyone seems to be saying my climbing days. Everyone's saying when he wants <laughs> oh, the soloist. And yeah. I'm like, 
That's it's a good. challenge. It's <laughs> not. It's, they're not done. <laughs> so. So you you still got plans to continue playing with friends for festivals? Oh, well, I can get around the cops and well, I can shoot get flares from the <laughs> scaffold. Yeah. That's the next thing. Yeah. Well, I think it's about time old King Kong came back and just fucking tore everyone a new one again. I mean, well, you know, these venues, what, I'm going to climb up a metre. Well, whoopee Joel, that's great. <laughs> you know, like, it's only really works on festivals that, you know... But um, if I can get up there, I, I'll get up there and I'll do it again. No, I mean, like, when I'm up there, I'm looking at the crowd, I'm thinking, God, I give them the show, I give them the best ever, and I'm looking at the whole crowd, and then at some point it does sort of knock you back a bit, and you go, fuck, there's a lot of people here, and you can really see everything. I mean, I wear glasses, so I can't really see everything, but I can, I can see that sort of brown smudge of people going all the way back and know that it's people but I can at some point I think when you're playing a gig you'd agree your adrenaline it goes on a, like a hyper state of just a lot of adrenaline I think I actually see better than what I do normally like, this place is haunted Bible John <laughs> look it up Barrowlands Bible John seriously um, but if yeah it's like your adrenaline and everything just focuses is a little tighter and I I think I can see better when I'm playing a gig and up there it's the best view in the world and they go, oh shit, I've got to do a solo. But sometimes it's so fucking high that I'm above the PA, so I'm up there with a the guitar and I can't even hear the band or the guitar and it's just going plink, plink, plink. If you've ever heard an electric guitar that's not plugged in, it's the most dis those dissatisfying yeah. fucking thing and there's like, you know, 60,000 people out there going, yeah, and I'm up there going... Pling, 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 pling. It's like this feels fucked. Oh, yeah. And then I just hold my guitar above my head. <laughs> but you got to sort of think, oh, I know that the PA's going. And then when I climb down, I can hear it going again and go, fuck, thank fuck, it was plugged in. Because, yeah, plink, plink, plink at the top of a, the top of that is it's pretty fucking shit. Guitar in the air. <laughs> Sick. I mean, that's pretty cool. But it's pretty spinal tap. <laughs> but that's like real life spinal tap shit. Yeah. Because I don't even know what key the band's in. You know, I'm up there just... You know, plinking away. And it's kind of hoping for the bad. Yeah, I can start playing fucking good. smoke on the water or something and just be like, cool. <laughs> uh, I'm happy in my world. Oh, well, part of this whole record was to chuck every rule book out the window. And in the past, um, most of the other producers we worked with along the way um, would always check, you know, oh, what, where are we at time wise at some point. And, you know, we were starting to do that in the studio and, and the first thing Cobb would say is, oh, no, fuck all that, like, it's as long as it's going to be. And we are like, cool. So then we just went for it and we didn't really question it too much. And it was only by about, like, sort of, you know, towards the end of tracking, we are like, fuck, should we add up the songs and see what we've got? And we are like, <laughs> fuck, I hope it's over 30 minutes. And the first, the half of the record, when we first had it, the time up, it was only, like, 15 minutes. We are like, oh, shit. <laughs> You know, we're contracted to do 40 minutes, and we're like, oh, well, you know, rock and roll, you know, <laughs> you get what you're given. <laughs> and, um, Just smack as many songs as you can. Yeah. You're fine. But look, the label were really cool about it, and they embraced the whole attitude of, we're making a 30 minute punch in the face, we're not going to bullshit you. It's, um, there's no self indulgent soloing going on, there's no, you know, it's not a bloody, um, uh, what do they call it? A, uh, those records called a concept album the concept of this is to punch you in the face and then and then it's done and if you want to hit repeat for another smack in the head then you get you get the chance to do that um but that was our thing we didn't really give a shit about time we didn't give a shit about uh whether something was perfectly in tune or not or whether uh you're just doing it because yeah. you really love doing it there's notes i'm singing on there that are sharp there's uh guitar solo stuff that are that are not that nothing's planned out. A lot of it's ad libbed, and um, a lot of it's first, third, or second, you know, second take. Oh well. Wow. Uh, that's really all it is, and that's why it's so urgent. Yeah. I think because that's you know, Cobb had an idea. We embraced it. We sort of didn't really think as much into it as the way he wanted to track it, as opposed to that. But as soon as we got there, he was like fucking so quick. He was just running around in circles, like the gear's already set up in the same way Led Zeppelin recorded Led Zeppelin 2 or something. And then we just fucking went for it. Lots of cups of tea. And, uh, and then when we first got there, Cobb was like, let's, guys, let's do some tequila. We're like, we just got off the plane, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, well, um, okay, <laughs> we'll have some tequila. And um, he's, a, he's a really cool guy. Um, I think more, he's one of those people, I think, that um, like with Mutt Lang, you know, he does not very many interviews, but 
he's someone who, who holds a wealth of knowledge is worth tapping into for any band at any level just to um to get to know him because being around him you just don't stop learning and then he also makes you feel good about what you're doing too like he, he embraces the rock thing you know, um as opposed to nashville which is phenomenal musicians live there a lot of session musicians and stuff like that that it fucking blow us out of the water like Fucking the best guitarists in the world come from that city. There's one of them playing on the stage with us tonight, Tom O'Brien. He's fucking oh, yeah. amazing. They fucking wipe the floor with us, <laughs> you know. And, um, uh, the only thing we do is we just we fucking hold it in a fist. We we attack a guitar. We play rock and roll. And we only know three chords, but fucking that's and that's what Cobb. He's that guy that helps you get it as a band together. It's a full band. It, it all locked in with one goal, with one with one thing. It's just us all rocking. Look, we're we're not going to be fucking around so long to get the next one out. Like we're not going to make you wait three years. Yes, love to. Yeah. Power Rage. It was my favourite because when I was younger and I first got that record, it felt like it was like my little secret because it was obviously not, um, you know, it was it was not one of their most famous albums or anything like that. It was not one of their biggest selling albums. Um, so when I got it, it felt just really special. Like, oh fuck, I'm I think I'm the only one who knows about this album. It's this is the best thing ever, um, and. You know, as a guitarist, it's like songs like Riff Raff and shit like that, it's just guitar Mageddon, basically. When we set out to do this record, it was to make it in the same mindset as the Alberts were making records with the Angels and ACDC. Oh, and the uh, and the Tats. Oh yeah. So yeah. it was a. Um, so yeah, like albums like Power Rage, TNT, and Let There Be Rock, Dirty Deeds, uh, you know, they were records that we were just really, as kids growing up listening to, same with the Angels and the Tats, with Alberts, is for us, <clears throat> after, there was a period where Alberts seemed to stop doing what they were doing, and it changed, but the whole flavour of music changed. ACDC also had left and making mega records like Back in Black, uh, with Mutt Lang and moving overseas, but George still being around, but not in terms of the same way that it was George and Harry. Uh, Ted Albert had uh, enticed them back to Australia from from England when they were working at Abbey Road. Got them in, you know, <laughs> Love Is All Around, you know, that song and all these big songs that they had uh, coming out of Australia, fucking mega hits, worldwide mega hits. It's, a, it's something Australia did and it's stopped doing. It's like we invented the two-stroke lawnmower, the black box you have in aeroplanes, um, and Alberts invented a sound through ACDC and the Angels and Rose Tattoo. And if you listen to those bands and the records they made in that era, there is a fucking like common thing going through all of that, an energy. And for us, we were sick of doing the same old sort of like, go to America, make a record like this, do this, like fuck this. Just because we didn't get to grow up with Alberts, doesn't mean we can't fucking research how they did it. We can't, the fucking internet's a mega mine of all this shit. Speaking of people who were there in the days and just getting every information we could and figuring it all out. And with Cobb, he was the master of that. He's the master of research in terms of Sonics and getting all that together. He said, sure guys, let's make Alberts in Nashville. Let's do it. And we're like, great, we're doing that. And we did all those things that, you know, I've read all the ACDC books everyone's read. I've read all the fucking, you know, uh, in excess books and everything, just a midnight all, anything to do with the way Australian recording was being d done back in the day. And we just fucking got into that mode. So for us, when to carry on the torch, as you said, it's not just a torch of like playing rock and roll in a way Australians are kind of known for it, or ACDC, it's, it's a way, it's, it's a fucking whole ethos of, of how Australians literally attack a guitar the way we see the world. It's not, we don't see the world as like, you know, we come here and I don't know, the, I don't know how other bands see it, but we come here 
to absolutely kick Glasgow's ass. It doesn't matter how, if we played this venue before. There's going to be 2,000 cunts in there tonight. We're going to give them the best we got. There's no show tomorrow. There is. There's, this tour keeps going. But um, tonight, it's only about today. And we come all the way from Australia. It's a fucking long way. So we're not going to come here and you know stare at our shoes kind of thing and fucking put a USB in and jump around with a fucking, you know, like a DJ set or something like and stuff like that. We come here with three chord rock and roll. It's gonna be loud, it's gonna be a good time, and it's Australian fucking made. And that's the point. The only lock in is probably your guitar or yeah, and maybe your speaking cab yeah, or something. My speaking cab. But I'm pretty open. It was uh, yeah. we went in there and kinda of, um, at points used some odd gear to get the sounds that we had in our head. Yeah. But it was all about um, dialing in sounds with your ears, not your eyes. Yeah. Doesn't fucking matter what it is or what it looks yeah. like or how it's EQ'd. Um, you know. We did that. So, sometimes it was literally EQ just the amp. <laughs> EQ yeah. the amp like that, or sometimes you know, Joel's even recording a song with just roll your head across the EQ, literally every single thing on ten and. Fuck, that sounds nasty. Yeah. Cool, let's go. Some of the solos were like that because yeah. it was like instead of using a pedal or something, it was like let's just fucking take the amp over the top. And there's a you'll hear if at any point in the record you'll hear that it's pretty obvious. But that was our thing. We just the gear was like one guitar each and um, yeah, a head and Do you a, a cat. Uh, <laughs> it was a JMP, a Marshall JMP, cool. uh, and it's from seventy. Nine. Look, the thing is, when you're on the road, and if you want to record an idea or something like that, and you're on the bus, and you're driving, or you're somewhere, things like Universal Audio, they also give you the amp buzz, so it gives you the, if you're in the headphones, you can sort of trick yourself into the zone, because yeah. it's still got the head comes up, and you can mess with the volume knobs, it's kind of like virtual, virtual sex with a fucking... Um, I'm thinking of Demolition Man with the squint and you got the Marshall flapping and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, you can so sort of like, like virtual yeah. reality. That's probably the next thing is virtual reality amps. There's nothing in the world that's going to beat the wind coming out of a, a cabinet, yeah. you know, blowing you. Blowing through. the wedge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is. Well, um, I think that's going to be wrapped up for the interview now. Uh, cool. I just want to say thanks again for allowing me this opportunity. It's been awesome getting to know you guys a little bit better. No worries, thank, thank you. Thank you, mate. And Great uh, questions.